Hey friends, it's Stacy from the FromScratchFarmhouse.com and today I'm addressing the elephant in the garden and that is that homesteading is expensive or at least it can be. Today I'm going to be sharing my experience with creating a household budget as a homesteader, share with you my exact method that I'm using to manage our family's money today, and give you my best tips for building a homestead on a tight budget. If you're new here, I'm Stacy, homeschooling and homesteading mama of seven, on a mission to ditch the grocery store and become more self-sufficient. Subscribe to our channel to learn more about our journey and how we are making that dream come true. Okay, before we get started, a little backstory. So when my husband and I were still a young couple, I devoured every book and blog post on budgeting. I became a big fan of Dave Ramsey and soon had our household budget figured out down to the penny. Then we became homesteaders, grew our family, moved to the country, and just life changed in general. And it felt like our old way of budgeting no longer worked. Our ways of both spending money and acquiring food were changing and our budget needed to adjust. Not to mention there was this little problem of continually buying livestock in barns and supplies all the while saying these purchases are going to save us money in the long term. It was an investment and yet we're just digging ourselves deeper and deeper into debt. If managing money is a struggle in your homesteading journey or you found yourself in debt and you're not sure how you're going to both accomplish your homesteading goals and become financially free, this video is for you. Also, before I go any further, just a little disclaimer. I am not a financial expert or a CPA or anything like that. I'm just a mom of seven who is also on this homesteading journey and has gathered a few ideas about what works and what doesn't when it comes to budgeting on the homestead. Today, I'm going to share with you my exact budgeting method that has in many ways facilitated all that we've been able to accomplish over the past few years. And it's also the plan we are going to follow in order to continue getting out of debt and building our homestead. Later, I'm also going to share my best tips for keeping homestead expenses to a minimum. And I'm also going to share my number one homestead budget mistake so that hopefully you can avoid doing the same. Okay, let's start by going over my homestead budgeting method. I have tried so many budget methods. I've tried the cash envelope system. I've tried computerized spreadsheets. I've tried apps. I've tried them all. And here's what I found. First of all, a cash envelope system does not work in our home. We live far from the nearest town and we often rely on making online purchases such as when we purchase from Azure Standard. And in reality, when we're purchasing from local farmers, they often want a check or a cash app transaction, not actual cash. So if I was to take out my grocery budget in cash, I would literally be redepositing it all in order to make my purchases. I'm not saying the system doesn't work for some, I know many who love it. However, it didn't work for us and so we have turned to using a debit card and an app, which I will explain later. Second of all, I lose cash. Or maybe I don't really lose it, but one minute I think I have plenty of money in my wallet and then I'm at the farmer's market trying to check out and suddenly I can't find any 20s. It just feels like too much to keep track of in my busy time of life. Another problem we have faced over the years and I know many of you are dealing with right now is a fluctuating income. I really think my system is ideal for managing the ebbs and flows of a variable income. So if that is you, don't worry. The big picture of how this budgeting system works is that all of our income is accumulated over the course of the month into one account. So for example, all of the money that comes from jobs or side gigs in the month of May is being accumulated over the course of May and then it is not touched until June. Now, don't panic if you're thinking, I can't get a month ahead right now, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Stick with me, just do this on a week by week basis and try to work your way up until you have a full month's amount of money to work with and and then you'll be able to do this full system to its capacity. But I completely hear you if you cannot get a month ahead. In the past, we have used our tax refund or other kind of bonus money that's come in to get ourselves ahead and into this position. Now, I'm going to put this all in paper for you so that you can see exactly how it works. However, just know that for privacy's sake, I'm not going to use my real numbers. So these are just numbers I've picked just solely because they're easy to work with. Okay, so I've set aside income for the month of May. Then on the first Thursday in June, I sit down and divvy out all of May's income into June's budgets. I start by paying the non-negotiables, which are all of the bills for June. If there are bills that aren't ready yet, I make sure that they are on auto pay and just subtract the amount as if it already went through. Next, I divide the remaining amount into my other spending and savings categories. For us, these are groceries, gas, farm, home, and land, family savings, emergency savings, and trips and entertainment. A little side note, in the past I have worked with having many different accounts where there is what's called a sinking fund for everything you can anticipate spending money on. 
For example, I had a sinking fund account called Car Tabs and one called Christmas, and then I would set aside a few dollars each month to go towards each account. I will say that there are perks to doing this, but clearly not enough perks to keep me doing it. Now I just lump expected recurring bills into our bills account, and unexpected expenses as well as gifts come from our family savings. So if you really like organization, create more accounts. If you want to keep it simple, a few main categories is just fine. To figure out how much should go into each account, you're going to have to look at previous bank statements and do some estimating. As you start using this budgeting system, you may have to make some adjustments. That's okay, it will be worth it in the long run. Finally, after all of my accounts have been funded, I subtract all planned purchases for the month. Now, to be honest, this is something I haven't been great about, but going forward, I'm going to be a stickler about writing down items we want to purchase and then waiting until the next month to purchase them so that they can be taken out of the budget at that moment. This will help us be more intentional about our purchases. Obviously, there are going to be things that come up that you absolutely need right then, but as much as possible, this process of keeping a wish list and then making intentional purchases while doing the month's budget is gold. Then, once the month's money is divided up into the accounts we budget for, we can divide the rest according to our financial goals. For us right now, this looks like paying off our debt. One of the biggest differences between my budgeting method and others out there is that our grocery budget is actually a combination of trips to the grocery store, bulk purchases, garden expenses, and animal expenses when those animals are bought for the purpose of providing food for our family. In order to make this work, the cost of growing and sourcing food and other disposables are looked at over a full calendar year. That total amount is then broken down into a monthly amount, which is put into our grocery account over the course of the year. Now, this can be literally a separate account with its own debit card, which is my preference, or you can just keep track of what that amount is and mentally keep it separate from your other funds. I'll show you an app that can help with this as well in a minute. Then, as we go through the months, there may be some where we only spend a few hundred dollars and others where we spend over a thousand. This works just fine since I know it will all balance out in the long run. To keep us on track and make sure that purchases are in line with our budget, I keep a list of expected food expense categories. As we go through the year, I then debit our purchases from the correct category. I also have a note next to each category about how I expect the expenses to unfold throughout the year. The purpose of this is to see when things get off track. For example, let's say that the price of fresh fruit goes way up this summer, and as I'm recording our purchases, I see that we have gone over what we expected to spend. In this case, I could go to our Azure standard order budget and decrease that, meaning we probably wouldn't be able to grab some of the extras we like to buy. So to review, we have a set amount that we're putting into our grocery budget each month, and then we are taking out different amounts each month depending on what needs to be bought at that time. This balances out over the long term because we have budgeted for the full year instead of each month. Okay, here's how to set this up for your own family. Start by listing out all the places that your family buys food and groceries. Groceries is considered anything that is disposable and you buy on a regular basis. Then create categories for each animal your family raises or plans to raise that year for food. Finally, add in a category for gardening. I recommend keeping fast food purchases separate unless this is something you do on a regular basis. For us, these outings come from our trips and entertainment budget since they can be totally eliminated as needed. This also helps keep it in perspective. It's easier to give up a trip through the drive-thru when you know that a trip across the country sounds so much more fun. Feel free to adjust the categories in a way that makes sense for how you spend money. For example, you may wanna have a category for each season's gardening expenses. For now, I keep all of my gardening expenses in one category. Also, this budget is not where I put expenses for things like animal structures, greenhouses, or other projects that will hopefully serve our homestead for longer than 12 months. The reason for this is so that I can easily see how much it costs me to purchase, source, and grow food each year and plan for the next. The goal in building things like a barn is for them to be an investment for many years to come. I also do not plan to put the purchase cost of my milk cow in this budget. I hope that she will last for many years and ultimately we are buying her for more than just the milk that she will provide. You can decide how different purchases will fit into your own budget. Another thing I wanna point out is that my grocery budget is not for the purpose of determining the true cost of growing food. For example, when we raise meat chickens, the true cost would include things like waters, feeders, housing, etc. 
These expenses, in addition to the cost of the building structures and buying milk cows, are instead taken from our farm, home, and land budget. You can certainly add these things to your grocery budget. Just keep in mind that this will cause the budget to change from year to year as your need for these items changes. After you have created all of your categories, the next step is to determine how much you can afford to spend on food and groceries for the entire year. Remember that this includes all food and all disposables, such as toiletries and paper products. Let's say you have about $1,000 to spend each month on these things. This means that for the entire year, you will have a total of $12,000 to spend. Place this number at the top of your budget. Next, you need to divvy up that total amount to your different spending categories. Not sure how much each should get? The best way to figure this out is by looking at old receipts and estimation. For example, I can look at the receipts I kept from when we butchered pigs last year to know the butcher fees. Then I can call the feed store and see how much a 50 pound bag of feed costs and multiply the number of bags we usually go through each week by that cost. I can get my total feed costs by multiplying this number by the number of weeks we plan to raise them to before butchering. Go through this process for each of your categories, but give yourself some grace in the first year of using this method. If you haven't been keeping detailed records of how much you are spending on these things, you will most likely have to make adjustments as you go. Another perk of using this system is that it keeps your list of grocery expenses in one place so that you can better plan for the year ahead. Optionally, you can keep the receipts in envelopes with each category name on it. Having the exact prices you paid for each item allows you to spot a good deal easily. Finally, after you have a budget set for each category, you should make any notes next to those categories that will help keep you on track. All right, so you have the total amount you have to spend on groceries for the entire year. You have budgets broken down for each category, and you have a general plan for how the purchases will play out. The most important part to making this new budget system work is to train yourself to use it on a daily basis. I recommend keeping it someplace where it will be handy when you're making purchases. So maybe this is in your purse, or for me, I just leave it on my desk at home since I do most of my purchases online. If I go somewhere to purchase groceries, I will just plan ahead before I go and bring receipts home to record them. One thing we are still working on is establishing a good system for making sure both my husband and I are on the same page with our budget. For example, if he stops by a store, how is he supposed to know what we have available to spend? Now, in large part, this can be avoided just by going back to what I was talking about with planning out our purchases ahead of time, but for other times we need a system. Up until now, this has just looked like him bringing home receipts to me or just simply checking our bank app and recording purchases in the correct categories. Just recently, however, I found an app that I'm making work for this purpose. It's called Fudget and I'm using the free version. And what I love about it is how extremely simple it is. This is not a mint.com app or something where your bank accounts are synced or anything like that. It's simply an app where you plug in your total budget for each category and then manually record your debits and credits as you go. That's it. There's also a desktop version of this app as well. All right, I know I've explained this budgeting system fairly quickly. I hope it all made sense, but if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the comments below. And then if you're looking for a more detailed training on this, I do plan to do one in the future. I'm not sure what that's going to look like yet, but make sure you're on my email list so that you can be notified when that comes out. And then once it's available, I'll put that link in the description as well. Okay, that is the rundown on our budgeting system here on our homestead. Now I'm going to give you a few tips for reducing your homestead expenses when you're building it on a tight budget. And I'm also going to share my number one budgeting mistake. The first way that you can save money on your homestead is to barter. I know I said this in my last video, but I think it's worth repeating because it can be so beneficial for all parties involved. And I really think we should do more of it. Another way to basically grow your own food for free is to double or triple what you're doing and sell the extra. So for example, let's say your family needs one pig for a year. Instead of raising one pig, raise three pigs, and then at butcher time, sell two of them to completely negate the costs of growing your own pork. You can use this in so many areas. You could sell plant starts in order to pay for your seeds, extra eggs in order to pay for your chicken feed, extra soap to pay for your supplies. The opportunities here are endless. The final homestead budgeting tip I have for you today is to live by the saying of use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. This was a saying from generations past that got them through in lean times. And it's something that we should apply to our lives today, I think, in order to spend less and be more resourceful 
helpful with the things that we already own. Now, I'm the first to say I quickly will run to the store to fulfill my need or fix a problem, and I really should be better about doing this myself. So I'm telling it to you, and I'm also telling it to myself, if we were just a little bit more creative and willing to work with what we have, we could save a ton of money. Okay, are you ready for my number one biggest budgeting mistake on my homestead? Diving into everything as a business before I could make it pencil on a homestead level. Now, I know not everyone is addicted to starting businesses like I am, so this may not be a concern for you, but if it ever occurred to you that instead of getting 10 baby chicks, you should get 160 baby chicks so that you could sell their eggs, don't do it. Start with 10 and build your way into making it a business if that works out in the long term. That way you can make it pencil on a smaller level, make sure it works for your lifestyle, and then ease into it. Now, if you are not someone who dives into making businesses, you can still apply this to your own life by starting small. Do something on a small scale and then grow your way into it. I know this can be so hard when you have these big goals that you wanna reach, but ultimately it's going to get you to your goals faster because you're not going to be doing the five steps forward, 10 steps back that comes with taking on debt and stress. Okay, I hope this video was a help to those of you who are trying to figure out how to make a household budget work on your homestead. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss my upcoming videos on homesteading, homeschooling, food from scratch, and creating a handmade home.